got the impression that the speech is already done. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, good morning, Brian, and Mr. Chair, Minister, uh, dear students, well, I, I think uh, you are meant, dear students, uh, as we heard about leaders of tomorrow, but just know that for me, you are already leaders of today. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of all generations, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here in St. Gallen. Thanks for inviting Swiss government for addressing you. And a warm welcome to Switzerland to all our guests. Well, I've been told that there are people from about 70 nations in this room. Usually, I'd like to welcome guests personally with some words in their own language, but 70 countries won't be possible today. And uh, what is it about today? Today is about the relationship between uh, generation, complex, highly interesting, timely, and Switzerland is a good place to talk about it because Switzerland is a platform, a natural platform, I would add, for dialogue. The relationship between generation is the very core of politics. The most important political decision, the biggest challenge we face, for example, here in Switzerland, the biggest challenges like reforming our social welfare system, preparing a new energy strategy, revitalizing the relations between Switzerland and the EU, or working for a stable and secure situation in Europe and the world, looking for peace. All these challenges uh, we bear, not for ourselves, but for those who will come after, after us, the next generation. It is, and it is simply right, it is simply valuable to think about the use, the next coming generation. The ultimate aim of politics and the original meaning of the Greek word is to manage the affairs of the cities, our common society, and prepare it for tomorrow. As members of government, leader of the economy or society, we do not build a better tomorrow for ourselves, but for our children. This is why I have chosen to focus on these three priorities during my presidency of the Swiss Confederation this year, youth, first of all, work, and openness. Well, let's start by having a look at uh, Switzerland today, in today's world. Switzerland is fortunate to have gone through the most recent economic turmoil with a high degree of resilience, growth, growth has been stable, Unemployment has remained low and is even rated among the lowest in the world. Also for the younger generation, Switzerland as a global leader in innovation, one of the most competitive countries in the world. In fact, the most competitive according to the World Economic Forum rankings and the outlook for our country is good. Well, lots of jobs, bags of ideas. Of course, we may have to face new obstacles, sudden difficulties or changes, particularly after decisions that weaken or jeopardize um, our economic advantages. This is why the Swiss government and parliament are recommending that the people reject the popular initiative seeking to introduce a minimum wage by law. It is also the reason why the Swiss authorities have underlined the possible economic difficulties objectively following new legal limits to immigration from the EU earlier this year. In spite of everything, the fact that the economist declared Switzerland as the best place to be born in 2014 sends a very clear message. Switzerland owes this success to several factors. On the international stage, this country's major strength lies in its openness and its sense, its sense of responsibility. Openness. First and foremost, openness toward Europe. The European Union is our main economic partner and Switzerland is the fourth most important economic partner for the EU. EU Switzerland, one billion Swiss franc trade volume per working day. One billion Swiss franc. 
We are tied together by an important body of bilateral agreement that help both economics to prosper and allow the EU and Switzerland to benefit mutually from their expertise in research and in innovation. Last week, the Federal Council took steps to relaunch discussions with the EU on Switzerland's participation in EU programs and market access. What do we want? We want to renew our bilateral relationship so that it will remain a central pillar of Switzerland's success for generations to come. And it is as well in the interest of the EU people. Switzerland also shows a great deal of economic openness beyond our continent, openness toward the world. In the last few years, we have signed around 20 free market agreements with countries on all continents, from Singapore to the Arab Gulf countries to the Central American states and China last year. But benefiting from this openness comes with a responsibility to act, a responsibility to act in favor of it. Conscious of the value of peace, Switzerland is an active member of the international community. We know that we owe to the last decades of peace on our continents and we work hard to secure it for the future. Peace is the basis of a good life for new generations. Switzerland's experience of dialogue and bridge building between antagonistic uh, positions inspires how it views the world. Building bridges through dialogue, that is what we strive to achieve through the diplomatic activities initiated in and from Geneva. It is also the aim of different forums that are based in Switzerland, such as the World Economic Forum, or of course, this very symposium in St. Gallen, to provide platforms for dialogue. And ladies and gentlemen, in today's world of communication, everywhere, dialogue is nothing obvious. Building bridges and fostering dialogue to produce cooperative solutions. This is also what is needed most to de-escalate and to reconstruct in Ukraine. At this year's chair uh, of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, Switzerland has been strongly engaged in effort to assist Ukraine in resolving this crisis. It is still possible to move from the log logic of escalation to a logic of cooperation and reverse the negative dynamics that have weakened the stability of both Ukraine and Europe, but time is of the essence now. Over the past days, we've been in contact with all sides to find a common way forward. Yesterday, I met with President Putin in Moscow and later with President Van Rompuy in Brussels. The message I put forward at, as OSC chairman, Swiss OSC chairman in office was twofold. First of all, I, I told them that a Swiss chairmanship of the OSC, that is a double impartiality. And that is uh, key for this situation. And then I said, we need a roadmap, but an effective one for the stabilization of the situation in Ukraine. A roadmap, very operational, that is supported by Ukraine, Russia, the EU, and the US. I let out what we think should be the elements of this roadmap. <laughs> refrain from violence, first of all, and then disarmament, and then national dialogue, and then elections. Discussion on these issues are ongoing, but after yesterday's signals of de-escalation, first one, there is room for compromise. Second, we said that the OSC and the Swiss chairmanship are ready to take, uh, to take up a lead role, to take responsibility, precisely, in coordinating implementation of this roadmap. COC is monitoring the security situation, supporting Ukraine in implementing the escalation measures and, measures and preparing for observing the elections. I proposed yesterday that it could also facilitate this national dialogue, that is building bridges for all parts of Ukrainian society to recapture common ground. Ladies and gentlemen, the international context is important for Switzerland's success, but there are also domestic factors that contribute to it. Since its beginning in 1848, this country has built itself on liberal values 
and liberal constitutions, constitution that views its citizens as free, as responsible beings. Switzerland developed a unique form of direct democracy that involves these free and these responsible citizens in all major decision-making processes. Federalism ensures that the regions and local communities making up the state are equally free in making their own decisions and are able both to complete, to compete and show solidarity with one another. Economic and political liberty comes at a price. It requires a high level of education. For this reason, Switzerland invests a great deal in educating its citizens, both in practical vocational training and in academic education and research, which forms a solid basis for our strengths in the field of innovation. The results are both low unemployment and a high degree of political maturity among Swiss citizens. Indeed, two years ago, for instance, Swiss citizens even rejected the possibility of having additional holidays. When I say that abroad, nobody believes me. <laughs> and they said after that, hope you don't want, Didier, that we have the same direct democracy, because in our countries it would be accepted. <laughs> There is also a societal component to Switzerland's success, national cohesion. The cohesion between the different political, economic, and cultural forces that constitutes our society. National cohesion is a crucial, but not always easy, task for a country that speaks four languages, has 26 sovereign sub-entities, 26% of its population has been born abroad, Switzerland has developed a political culture that protects minorities and values social diversity as a strength. Union in diversity is one of Switzerland's key strengths. As a consequence, Switzerland values dialogue and compromise. There are no outright winners or losers. Power is always shared. You can observe this in the aftermath of a popular vote. But it's, it goes further. Switzerland takes it, its, its differences and builds new strengths out of it. Like scientists in multidisciplinary research centers, we combine the differing visions and expertise of the various persons and profiles to find new solutions and new ideas. You can observe this positive dynamic in the relationship between employers and employees or in the relationship between generation. The relationship between generation is indeed a central element of national cohesion. Intergenerational equity is key in strengthening societies and lessening potential tensions. We should view this relationship not as a potentially dangerous clash, but as an opportunity, a source of differences that reinforce society. Today, the demographic evolution is pointing towards more elderly people and fewer young, younger ones. On a global scale, the number of people over the age of 65 will double within the next 25 years. If we take the 1,000 people in this room as representative of the global population, 80 of you should now be older than 65, and by 2035, this figure will increase to 130. This is, first of all, good news. It's proof that healthcare is getting better and more affordable for more people. But the changing demographic also poses several, several serious challenges that have the potential to destabilize the cohesion of our societies. Western countries are confronted with paradoxical problems such as labor shortage and often at the same time with youth unemployment. Labor shortage on one side and on the other hand, youth unemployment. Always a question on how to finance pension benefits and education at the same time. Clearly, these internet intergenerational challenges are global and they are serious. They threaten the stability of nations and regions. We must face these challenges, transform the risk into opportunities if we want a world that is more prosperous, that is more equitable as well, a world that offers more prospects for the young 
and more dignity for the elder generation and hence a stable world. And that is definitely what we would like. Internet generational differences have always existed and have always been a way for a new generation to assert their values and demands. But with aging society, we cannot afford to waste energy in such clashes. Instead, we have to build bridges once more between generations this time. That is the way to advance our societies. There is no quick fix to intergenerational conflicts, but we should not consider clashes between generations to be inevitable. We all have a responsibility towards society, towards the future. It is our duty to listen to all generations, to their concerns. This may sound trivial, ladies and gentlemen, but it is not. In many countries, people, especially the younger generation, do not feel heard. To feel heard in a lot of countries is unheard of. It may choose, they may choose violence to expre express their needs. They may choose violence to express their dream or frustration, which can lead to clashes on the streets. Government must listen to the younger generation, design policies addressing the needs of all generations, and advance solutions to specific problems. We must take clear, targeted measures that enable all generations to live in liberty and dignity. The focus should lie on education and social security. Government by the people, government for the people, like Abraham Lincoln said once. Switzerland is convinced that strengthening education in a broad sense, both academic research and vocational training is fundamental in order for its citizens to acquire the skills required by the labor market. High quality education helps citizens develop the resilience to protect them from unemployment. More and more countries are developing vocational on the job training, which has been proven to contribute significantly to lower youth unemployment. Switzerland has long-standing experience with vocational training and encourages its, this development. It's a field where partnership, partnership between the public and the private sectors is particularly fruitful. Businesses, too, have an interest in a well-trained workforce and hence have a responsibility to help young people entering the labor market. For we should never forget that the millions of young women and men with their dreams and aspirations, their ambitions and their appetite for life are a huge reservoir of energy to fuel the future of mankind. All the other hand, at the other hand of this uh, generational spectrum, the age of retirement. At this age, many people are in full health and have a life expectancy that is longer than ever before. That is a success of our societies, science, public health, social welfare. Retaining people longer within the workforces makes sense of themselves as well. Older people have a lot to offer society and the economy, and we should develop incentives to use this potential of life. It is beneficial to the economy, and it helps finance our social system. In Switzerland, the pension system is financed through three different pillars. This tripod is quite stable. It rests upon the responsibility of individuals, companies, and on social welfare. In other words, it is a mix, a mix of solidarity between the generation and individual responsibility. This model has proved to be a great success so far, but as in many countries, we are faced today with the question of how to finance pension and health care tomorrow. The Swiss government recently proposed a set of measures designed to confront this challenge by building on a flexible retirement age and on incentives for other people to remain in the labor market. Again, businesses have a shared responsibility toward older generations and an interest in participating in the effort to keep them in the labor market. They have invaluable experience and keeping them in the labor market is in everybody's interest, including the younger generation that can learn from them. A very valuable circle of life. A last point, ladies and gentlemen, a financial one. Switzerland developed and applied the golden rule of budgetary policy that works, in fact, as a guarantee for intergenerational equity. The debt break. 
The debt break's primary aim is to avoid current generations living above their financial means and creating debts that future generations will then inherit. As such, it is an important factor of equity between generations. The debt break had been, has been introduced by many European countries these last couple of years, but the canton of St. Gallen here has been a pioneer in this respect and applies the debt break since 1929. You see, St. Gallen is definitely an excellent and natural place to debate the relation between generations. Ladies and gentlemen, the greater the challenge, the greater the opportunity. Let us see different generations as complementary and join forces. Thank you for debating. Thank you for looking for solution. And have a good day. Thank you very much.